Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, pleased to be joined by uh, Senator Nielsen, Supervisor Teeter, Assemblyman uh, Bigelow will be joining us here uh, presently as well. Thank all of you uh, for coming. We're here today to talk about wildfire pre prevention and treating it like the emergency that it is in our state. And the plan that we are focusing on has the goal of protecting lives, homes, and property, and treating this like the sense of emergency that it is, not just in certain parts of our state, but in all parts of our state. And that's what this is all about this morning. We need to have a governor that is going to put wildfire prevention and wildfire fighting on a war footing. It's that serious. We need to have the resources. We need to change what we're doing with the overall goal of protecting lives, protecting homes, protecting property. And it's going to take an all hands on deck approach. Again, it's not just certain areas of this state, but all portions of the state. I am going to treat this like the emergency that it is. And as governor, I will declare a statewide emergency to allow for fuel reduction for all of the projects that have been on the list that haven't been able to go through because of environmental regulations to actually get them accomplished and to get them accomplished now. We're talking about emergency exit routes. We're talking about fuel breaks. We're talking obviously about fuel reduction. It's incredibly important that these come off lists and actually into reality. That's what the statewide emergency will be all about. And I will also ensure that we have the dedicated funding to make this happen. Unlike our governor who cut $150 million from the wildfire prevention budget this last year, I understand how important it is to not just have funding but a dedicated ongoing source of funding year after year with a minimum investment of one billion dollars. I'm going to have Senator Nielsen talk about the budget and about the back and forth unfortunately that went on like this. Again, we have to change our approach. This is a commitment that says the status quo hasn't been working and why we need to dedicate the resources and the sense of urgency to make this happen. I will also help to coordinate when it comes to wildfire prevention with the wildfire prevention department to streamline, to make sure we're not just focusing on our state projects, but all the local projects, to make sure we are putting forward all of our best efforts to make sure again that these projects come off lists and actually in to reality. And again, we're taking some of the suggestions from best practices that have been around our state for several years. And I also believe it's incredibly important that so many Californians who are in dangerous areas get the help that they need in terms of home hardening. And so I will move forward with a $10,000 tax credit to ensure that these home hardenings actually become reality and not have to go through a state bureaucracy which takes too much time and effort. Everybody should in these fire prevention zones should be eligible for a $10,000 tax credit. And I think that's incredibly important. Again, with one goal, what this entire plan is about is about a sense of urgency. And it's a sense of urgency in all of the areas across our state that need that attention, that need that help, that need that support, that need to cut through these regulations and get these fire breaks built, get these evacuation routes accomplished, reduce our fuels in our forests finally, not just talk about it, but actually make a difference. And so that's why I'm excited to have the help and the support from so many Californians who understand this sense of emergency. Uh, and we're gonna have a few speakers here who have re literally been on, on the front lines on wildfires, on changes that we make, on advocating changes that have gone, unfortunately fallen on, on deaf ears. The first one I'm uh, introduce is no stranger to all of you, of course, is uh, Senator Jim Nielsen, who's been uh, on a stalwart for ensuring doing the right thing, but also sticking up for the appropriate amount of funding uh, and, again, for the reforms that need to happen on a statewide level. He has lived it. Senator Nielsen, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mayor Falconer, and thank you for being here to be supportive of our efforts. 
This isn't a new phenomena for decades, dating with me back to the Brown One administration, where managing our forests and wildlands, stopping the enormous increase in fuel and the fires that ensue therefrom, that was state policy. We weren't going to do anything, leave the forests alone. Now we have in the last few years suffered the ravages of that folly. And Jerry Brown one was around for that. And now we have a fellow named Newsom. I'm one of the fellows who represents paradise, a whole community destroyed, destroyed by a fire that was not necessary. And there's a part of an area up there that the, by the lake where they did in fact do some cleaning and that area did not get affected. Now here's my point. This governor is great at having press conferences every day. The newest shiny object he embraces. And he did come up and tended to things initially in paradise. But then it wasn't a sexy thing anymore so he's gone. Money has been put into the budget for fire safe and hair, uh, forest and wildland management. However, a recent disclosure by a public TV station, the media, did an examination of the monies that the legislature put in the budget over the last couple of years, and I was sitting right in the middle of it as vice chairman of the budget committee. Money was there, and it had spent it, did not spend it on the heels of the most ravaging fire we've ever had that destroyed one whole community. So does the administration, does the governor learn by his mistakes? Obviously not. The very budget that we're just voting on now puts substantial money, nearly a half a billion dollars available, as some of it's carryover, but for forest and wildland management, prevention. But it doesn't really tell us that that's going to go to the locals, the local fire safe councils. What we don't need is a bunch of 501c3 environmental organizations sopping up that money for their priorities. Our priorities is to limit the fire threat to our public. And another point, to the wildlife. Environmental organizations never talk about the devastating impact to wildlife and their habitat that these fires bring forth. Well, what do we have in our budget right now that just passed? Well, there's the money. Wow, how wonderful. Except in this power grab that seems to be obsessive in this administration, the expenditure of that money is contingent not on the vote of the elected representatives, but of the Department of Finance, the function of the governor themselves. So it's easy for them to forget to spend that money and decide that that money would be better spent elsewhere. Now, why am I here with Kevin Falconer? Because he has pro proven that he will deliver on his promises. I give you one great example, the homeless. Up here, what we do is throw money at homeless. That's it. Just throw money at it. And if it helps, fine. Most of it does not. In San Diego, he set up the course of doing the things that were required to keep people from being homeless, to empower them to be successful and not have to live on the streets and not have that be that their lifestyle. He kept his promise to the citizens of San Diego. And I have no doubt he will keep his promises to us. I know him well enough to feel confident of that. And he's come here to be with us. It gets it. And we are tired of the oblivion, the black hole of the executive branch of government. In fact, lastly, the thing that offended me most about this most recent situation is the governor, instead of accepting responsibility, he threw his director of Cal Fire into the firestorm to cover for him. That's not leadership, folks. That's cowardliness, and that's not the kind of leader that's going to get us into the future. Glad to be here with you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce, of course, uh, Assemblyman Bigelow, who is uh, 
uh, no stranger to the challenges and has been a true champion for some of the changes and reforms that are so desperately needed in the state. Assemblymember, glad you're here. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. You know, for all of you, you probably don't know me. So we'll start off. Frank Bigelow. I represent Assembly District 5. Assembly District 5, let me get a brief description. It starts at the middle of Lake Tahoe, goes all the way down to the San Joaquin River between Fresno and Madera counties. On the other side, it has Mono County going all the way down to the Inyo County line. I border both California and the state of Nevada. I work with both governments to try to find common sense solutions to our common issues on the ground. Today, what you have is a set of common sense issues that Kevin Faulkner has put forward with solutions solutions to these problems that we're facing today. I want to let you all know, as we're standing here right now, fires are burning throughout the state of California. In Northern California, Senator Nielsen district and Assembly Member uh, uh, Daly's district and her husband, uh, Senator Daly, uh, huge fires, huge numbers of acres. Those acres had a small community called Doyle in it. Doyle had significant damage. Why did it have that significant damage? In part because they couldn't get the resources that were needed to help s stop those fires. So I'm going to tell you about my district. A little fire started on Saturday. I saw the smoke as I was going to find a part because I was working it on the ranch. I was on my way up the road and I came back and that fire was quite a big header in less than an hour's time. That hour's time has grown to now two and a half days of rapid deployment of equipment for this major fire that's grown into 10,000 acres with thousands of homes in peril. It is now, I just received word as walking over here, that it has jumped the main uh, road, road 600, and now it's climbing up a hill rapidly. If it reaches the pinnacle of that mountain, there will be no stopping that fire for days. Ladies and gentlemen, this is serious. Our current governor has not been throwing money at the fire services. He's been wasting time and resources. We we'll started out as seven and a half billion dollars being thrown for the fire departments to grow and have some true meaningful resources it was cut to five billion. Then it was cut to two. Now it's cut to one. Give me a break. Once again, too little, too late. This governor isn't doing his job in facing up to these responsibilities. Well, I'll give him a handshake and praise him on some of the good things he's done. Those aren't enough to compensate for the many thousands of people who have been impacted and are going to continue to be impacted without a common sense solution. Once again, Kevin Faulkner has taken the time to give us some tools in his plan. I hope you all pay attention to that plan. I hope you pay attention to Kevin Faulkner and help him seek those solutions by becoming the governor of the state of California. Thank you for coming out here today, and I appreciate every one of you for taking the time. Thank you, Assembly Member. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Supervisor uh, Doug Teeter. Um, again, no stranger to the challenge and the emergencies that are facing us, uh, who's been uh, an advocate and will also share some of his own uh, personal story. Supervisor, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Probably the state doesn't know that I'm Supervisor Doug Teeter. I represent District 5 up in Butte County. And Butte County, almost three years ago, had the campfire. Uh, 19,000 structures lost, over 80 lives. And, uh, you know, I'm here to support the former mayor of San Diego in that he has a plan to help prevent that in other communities. I've lived all over the state, college in San Diego, a career up in the Bay Area. I've seen what the mountains of Santa Cruz look like. I've seen what the areas outside of San Diego look like, and they're all ripe to burn. And we need to commit the resources needed and to prevent the losses, not only to the housing. I, I witnessed, I got stuck, I made it like a quarter mile from my house and watched home after home burn because it just started with a, a little fire in the gutter or a, a bush caught on fire. And so the, the plan that Mr. Faulkner has on uh, tax credits to help people harden their home are going to make those homes survive. And that's going to go a long way for insurability for the rest of Californians. And that's why I'm supporting Kevin Faulkner today. Uh, we need to take uh, evacuation routes and also the, the seriously and also the vegetation along those routes 
because I ended up on a road that had fire on each side. Cars were catching on fire. Those roads should be safety havens if you can't make it out of there or if you can't make it to a big parking lot. Uh, a lady died probably 200 feet from me because she opened her car door. She was a senior with uh, probably capacity issues, just opened her door into the fire. And, it, and it's, it weighs on my heart and I wanna prevent this in the future. So I'm here to support Kevin Faulkner and I wish everyone well. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, thank you. Uh, happy to answer uh, uh, any questions uh, from members of the, of the press and public. Saying you're going to do already being done in terms of fire breaks and other kinds of preventive measures. Are you just saying they're not happening fast enough, or, or, or they could be done better? They're not happening fast enough. They're not getting the adequate funding on the prevention. They're not happening at the local level. Again, what we're talking about is not just state property, but all of the local levels, with our fire districts and other councils in our our counties and our cities. Uh, particularly in Southern California, uh, that need to know that they're going to have a governor that's going to say, I am going to declare a state of emergency, waive the environmental regulations to get these actually done. And also a governor who is going to provide the funding for this prevention to actually happen, not up and down, but a dedicated source of funding. Uh, that is incredibly important. I appreciate what the supervisor just said, because what we've also, too many of us have seen time and time again, homes that, if they were hardened, could have been saved. I think this tax credit is going to allow us to more quickly provide that help and the support to more homeowners to actually do what we all want to have happen. Well, how about, uh, you mentioned tax credits, how about uh, mandatory building codes and then the restricting areas from people building at all? Uh, is that something you, you would consider? That? Yeah, we have to look. Certainly under emergency powers. Yeah, you do, and you have to strike the right balance from, from actually housing and homes, but also when we're particularly talking about the areas that surrounded these homes that were supposed to have fuel reduction that didn't get it. We're supposed to have evacuation routes constructed that can't get those routes done. That's what this plan is all about. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of Californians that should have that help that haven't been provided it because of the bureaucracy, because of environmental regulations. That's what I'm talking about in terms of a sense of urgency that says no more. And when, and when we see some of our priority projects that can't get done because of environmental regulations, we are putting families at risk. We are putting houses at risk, property at risk for no reason. But then why not require people who are either going to rebuild or build, uh, require them to, to meet certain uh, uh, building codes and not let people build in areas that uh, uh, can't be uh, made safe. Yeah. There's a lot of acreage in California. Uh, you can't make it all safe. No, that's right. And obviously, that's, that, and zoning becomes a very big part of that. Uh, but also allowing folks that are in fire-prone areas that have built their homes to be able to take advantage of home hardening will make a huge difference. But what do you think about mandatory home hardening, basically? Well, I think this is giving everyone, look, we have homes that have been built for decades. But to require them to build I think this will allow us to actually do that, to give them the tax credit to do it. It'll make a huge difference. There's already the something? regulations, and this I would will like help to, from that standpoint. Either one Keep of us in mind that Yeah, no, go ahead. The assemblyman's been, yeah. the assemblyman's been working on this in the supervisor. I, you know, I'm rebuilding my home right now, working on that, and the current uh, building code in California uh, requires the things that you're, you're asking about. They require uh, fire-resistive the siding. They, they require, you know, a certain uh, distance of flammable, like fencing can't go up against homes anymore. So that's already in the code. And, uh, you know, for the money that I think will benefit the tax credit, we need affordable housing in California. That's a huge issue. Paradise was a lot of homes, 40s, 50s, 70s, 80s. They didn't have that in the code. And that's, that's where I see the biggest benefit for this tax credit is to help people that have older homes that aren't building, you know, 2018 or, or the ones in the current, you know, building code, get them to harden up their homes so they don't have to rebuild. Thank you. Something, did you want to add something? I know it's been on the forefront. I think those are some very legitimate questions. You just heard the supervisor speak about it. I'm a former county supervisor and I've lived through these uh, challenges. 
many of you probably know, in 2012, the Rim Fire was the third largest fire, 257,000 acres. I was the incoming uh, assembly member at that time. I also knew that territory, and I was a firefighter at the time. That fire had a lot of tragedy to it as well, and so a lot of people lost their homes. But those people rebuilding those homes are now required to build them at the newest and latest standards, and we're talking about the latest and greatest. On top of the, having the, the special hardy board and all the special venting that's required, they have to have sprinklers installed in them, which means they have to have a water source that's reliable and it can sustain at a certain pound of pressure for a period of no lay, less than 30 minutes so those sprinklers can operate. So all the things that you're concerned about and you're asking for are already in place and happening today on the ground. What uh, Mr. Faulkner's proposing now is waiving some of those rules under the CEQA process to make sure that we can get the job done. The real crux of the issue that you want to talk about is the neglect that's just criminal in my way of putting it to our environment by people who have not cleaned up their properties but they haven't been able to clean it up because of the regulations that are put in place. If you own a piece of property today and you want to take down a tree that's over 18 inches in thickness, you can't do it without having a timber harvest plant. Are you aware of that? And some people have trees just like this all on their property where a building site like this is a perfectly good place to build, but they can't take the trees down because they got to go through what's no, going to cost them no less than $100,000 to do a plan. We have too many regulations put in place, too much red tape. Can we please let the people live where they want to live, but do it responsibly and respectfully? I believe we can do it, and I believe he has a plan to accomplish that. Not the same old rhetoric that we've had for too long saying, no, no, you can't do this. Folks, we've got to change. If California's going to dig out of this slump, we've got to rebuild it, and we've got to rebuild it from the ground up, and we've got to have the right people in place. Kevin Faulkner is that right person. He's not perfect, neither am I, and neither are you. But we can work together to achieve what will be a better day for California. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Faulkner, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was just checking this on the Cal Fire website this morning. For yeah. homes that are in what's called the state responsibility area, they're already required to have 100 feet of yeah. defensible space, and they can be fined. And AP's done some reporting on this um, in the past. The fines are like applied unevenly. So some places are fining a ton of people, yeah. some places Got aren't. This. So uh, how does that work with your tax credit plan? Now that you're offering an incentive, would you also, like, would you remove the fine? Or because there's an incentive, would you step up enforcement to find people that don't take I, advantage of I, it? I, I think they go hand in hand. I, I do. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And that's something that we've talked about. You have to follow the law. We also have to make sure, particularly as the assembly member just said, that our older homes that have been constructed from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, we have to allow folks to say, we want you to do the home hardening. Um, and if you have to go through a big bureaucracy to try to get the, the money from the state, that's going to take too long. The whole genesis of what we're talking about is urgency, that sense of we have to do this now. And that's why I think the tax credits will allow everybody to take advantage of this. Um, time's wasting. We, we can't afford to wait. But would you keep the fine in place? And I wouldn't if, change you know, that. After right. a year, you know, people haven't taken advantage of it. Are you going to step up enforcement? That's not something fine? I'm looking to change. Okay. Keep in mind, this is really in part. Go ahead, Jeff. You're going to talk to me. This is really in part about empowering that property owner. Notwithstanding that they could get a permit to do something, they can't afford it. And I mean, I. These fellas and I have been around. These are our constituents. These are some of our own family that are hard pressed. And having some immediate money to do that, that is critically important. And let me add one more dimension to this too. It's a long-term agenda of some. And that agenda is to depopulate rural California. Depopulate. So if we just let these fires rage and blower, some people are gonna be real happy about that because that will dispose people not to move out there. It suits me just fine.